her sister lived in Los Angeles. And so we went there for summer in Los Angeles and it just happened to be right at the very end. And my first game I remember so well was um, Phoenix versus Boston in the, in the finals. And that was okay. the first NBA game I ever watched. And uh, Paul 76. Westfall, I think, was with the Phoenix. And um, before that, I'd never watched a game. So I grew up totally on, on Mika. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a huge, huge Toyota fan. Um, I was a huge Moralco fan before that. And uh, <laughs> I hated Crispa. Oh, I hated Crispa too, with a passion. Although I, I became close to Baby Dalupan later on. Uh, he was like my nemesis, you know. I, I hated Baby Dalupa <laughs> growing up. He always beat our Toyota or Morocco teams. And uh, actually, the, as the story goes, if you don't mind me just going on yeah, it a little go bit, right ahead. Um, my best friend at that time, his name was Stanley Fields. He had an older sister, and his older sister was dating Fort Acuna. Oh, okay. Ooh. And so we got because because of we he would come over to the girlfriend's house all the time and so we got to know Fort really well because I was always over there this is we were living in uh, San Lorenzo village in in, uh, in Makati at mm -hmm. the time and uh, I used to be there because he lived like five houses down away from me I used to be over there all the time Fort would come over he would bring a couple of players sometimes that uh, with him and then we just he just started inviting us to practices so we got to see a bunch of Morocco practices we actually went to a movie at Morocco Theater with the Morocco team. And that was, you know, Mon and Mon Fernandez and Francis Arnais was there, Jimmy Mariano, Big Boy Reynoso. Uh, Mon and, 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 and Francis were the young kids. Uh, and even Jorsky was the young kids at that time. They were the, the, the new kids on the block at Morocco. So I've had a huge history uh, uh, watching, watching Toyota and, and especially Morocco growing up. And so who I just kind of went all the way through. Who were your favorite players, coach? I'm mean, at the time. I, you know, who were guys um, you wanted to be? Like I know you played basketball as well. Eventually, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I was just like everybody else. I was a huge Jaworski fan, but my my real guy was Mon Fernandez. Um, I, I Mon was my 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 big hero. Um, he. He went on to uh, what Manila Beer was that Manila Beer he went on mm -hmm. to and then George he went on to uh, uh, Gilby's I think Gilbis. it was yeah. and, and so we kind of had to kind of part ways at that time and I became a Manila Manila Beer fan mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I was also a big Francis our nice friend fan because he was a guard and I was a guard and I wanted to emulate him um, and I also you know it just for some reason. We were all at the international school. For some reason, we were all fans of Yo-Yo Martinez. I mean, we were always <laughs> imitating his layup during our practices, and, but we were all fans of Yo-Yo. So uh, he was a big impact uh, on us when, when we were young. And how, how did you, uh, so when you, what was your first coaching? Did you coach before the PBA? Um, you know, I went to college. I ended up going to college in the States mm -hmm. and I played a couple of years of college ball. And then I tried to walk in, walk on a division one team. Um, and then I went back after college. I went back to San Francisco and I, I joined some pro-am tournaments and uh, uh, I was able to dabble in some, into some assistant coaching at that time. Mm -hmm. But generally, no, it was never really a goal of mine to be a coach. Um, I was working at a bank in San Francisco after college and I hated it. <laughs> um, and after about uh, eight months, I called my mom and I said, mom, you know, I want to come home. And uh, of course I was the youngest and she was empty nesting at her house. And I mean, mom and dad. And so they, please come on home. You know, you can entertain us. So I did, I came back, but the first year I back, I was back in Quezon province, but this time in Southern Quezon in the Bundok Peninsula, uh, just mm -hmm. South, South of Lucena. Mm -hmm. And I lived there for a year uh, with my parents um, and my dad was working down there. So I lived there and didn't live in Manila. Uh, so I was there for the first year and I wanted to be a writer. That was my big thing. Mom, I want to come back to write. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be the next Hemingway or William okay. Faulkner. And uh, so I wrote for about a year, worked, on my, worked with my dad down there and then uh, ran out of money, kind of got bored. Uh, met my wife to be in one of my 
sojourns up to Manila. You know, we used to take R and R up in Manila. And one time I went out with a friend and met my wife. And uh, after that, I didn't want to live in Manila. I didn't want to live in the province anymore. I wanted to be here and hang out with her all the time. So uh, mm -hmm. she, I, I, I blame her for ruining my writing career. She was, it was all her fault. <laughs> Um, so, but we did it for seven years before I finally, we finally got married. How long were you back in Manila that. at the time? I mean, you said you came back from, from, uh, Quezon, then you went to Manila already. What year was that? The um, that was like 19, late 19, really late 1982, early 1983. Mm, okay. When I came back, I graduated college 19, uh, you know, June or May or June, 1980. And, uh, like I said, I spent a little bit of time in San Francisco uh, working and hating it, hating life. I didn't didn't start living until I got back here. <laughs> During the time when you were working in a bank, did you ever, did basketball ever recur to you at, at any point? I mean, did you think that if I had stayed in the Philippines, I might have done something in basketball or did it just totally escape you while you were working in that bank? Well, I was, like I said, I was really into writing at that time, and but I was still playing basketball. I mean, I was, you know, playing around the city. I was joining leagues. Uh, 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 actually, played in a in a, in a Phil Am league uh, in San Francisco. Um, so I was playing a lot, uh, and I was also picking up the game of tennis at that point too. Um, so I was kind of going between basketball and and uh, tennis, um, but. I wasn't very good in tennis, that's for sure. But uh, um, like I said, I was doing a little bit of coaching now. I'd coach teams in the in the in the, in the pro am leagues, and and uh, um, but I really didn't think about coaching until much later. Until actually, I ran into uh, in one of those. Uh, well, when I came back to Manila, I started living back in Manila. I went to uh, uh, U it's a U.S. ambassadors party. Um, I'd never been to one before, never been to one since, but for some reasons I got into that party. I don't know how, but there in the party was Fred uh, Wittenson. And okay. uh, that's how we hooked up when we started seeing each other again. Um, uh, we went to high school together and we spent, uh, when I was in college, uh, believe it or not, he was in the boarding school in the same campus uh, mm -hmm. going to high school. He had left Manila and gone to a boarding school. It just happened that I went to college at the same uh, uh, high school that he was at. So we saw each other there as well. But we were never close growing up because there was like, you know, we're five, six years uh, difference in age. Um, and he was a little pipsqueak, you know, running around IS and we were you know, beating him up all the time. Um, and um, then he became this, you know, incredibly big time uh, swimmer in, in USC and uh, I mean which was the number one program in the whole country it was you know he had an amazing amazing career in swimming and uh, he became the, the real stud now and we, we couldn't kick him around anymore <laughs> but from being a big uh, Toyota, as you said Toyota fan Juan Fernandez mm -hmm. fan so that's that beer house and it was 1984 and then you know then he moved on to Tandoi etc but then you find yourself all of a sudden as part of the PBA because you're sitting on the panel. Yes. And that was, again, that was your vintage. That was Fred uh, Uitensu. He was the one who got me into vintage. He uh, learned, uh, uh, well, at that time, I was going to a lot of games with him to Alaska, uh, the Alaska games. Uh, uh, first coach that I started watching was Tudo Balanzona, and Nat mm -hmm. Clemson was, was coaching for a while, and then Boggs. Uh, and I, I, during that, at, while Bogues was coaching, I started working on the panel. Uh, Fred had told uh, Bobum Velas that, uh, you know, I was a basketball guy. I grew up playing, but I call it, played college ball. And, and I, knew the, I knew the, you know, the, the, the league and I knew the players from before. And, and it might be interesting to see if I could do, you know, do some panel work. And so I went there, he called and I went to a tryout and, uh, um, and they, they decided to put me on. I think it was the worst decision they ever made. I mean, I was terrible. Uh, I knew the game, but I didn't know how to, how to, how to, how to say it. But uh, it was a lot of fun, you know, and I had a chance to meet with all, you know, to work with all the greats, you know, Pingoy Pengson and, 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 and uh, uh, Sev, uh, of course, Joe. Um, and and it, was, it was a lot of fun working with all those guys back in the day. Um, 
And just over time, because I was just so involved in the league, I just started getting involved with Alaska as well. And that's how I got to be a head coach. Well, can we dwell a bit more on that? I'm sure you guys are curious. <laughs> Noel wants to know. You know, I mean, you come from you come from uh, the panel, and then all of a sudden, there's a coaching carousel going on in Alaska. It's one coach after the other, and all of a sudden, um, you come in. How, how does that happen? How how do, how do you end up as a coach? Well, I was coaching the international school, my alma mater team. I was coaching the international school, um, and I wasn't getting paid for it. I, I mean, it wasn't a hired position. I just did it because I, I, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands and they needed a coach and I knew the, uh, uh, the athletic director. And so I, I took over one of the teams and uh, um, I'll never forget that we, we played, I don't know if anybody's interested in, in hearing this, but we played our first game in Clark Air Base against Wagner High School. And uh, we were down 32 points at halftime. That was the first official game I ever coached. We were down 32 points at halftime. Uh, those poor kids I had. I came into that halftime and I threw my play board. I threw down a, uh, a locker. And I mean, I was all over those guys. And, and I feel, still feel bad about that to this day, how I, I got on those young kids. But uh, um, we ended up beating that team later in the year and breaking a, like a 53 game winning streak. and. We went to the finals and played them again, got beat in the finals, but we made it to the finals. I lost my first seven games as a coach. We lost our first seven games. And then we ended up winning six of our next eight and uh, made it to the playoffs just barely. And then we did well in the playoffs and won the semifinals. And Fred came to watch the semifinal game. And he actually came in and talked to the players before the game. And he had a, an incredible speech and, we were the underdogs going into that game, and we just, our guys were just diving all over the floor. We were playing incredible defense, and we upset this team and went back and went to the finals and played in the finals. So I, I, I think Fred watched that game and said, hey, maybe this guy can coach. You know, they're kids, but maybe he can coach. And, uh, um, and so I started off as, a, yeah, there was a carousel going on. Uh, um, it's really a long story, but... Uh, uh, the bottom line is I started consulting first. Uh, they, they moved away from books and they hired the general manager uh, to be an interim coach. And he wasn't really a basketball guy. So they asked me to help him out. And Fred asked me to help him out. So I did. And then I, over about half a conference, I became an assistant coach. And then after about another conference, I became the head coach. And my import, when I took over the team, lo and behold, was Sean Chambers. He had, come in as a, he had come in as a replacement. Uh, um, and then about after his third or fourth game, I was hired as the head coach. So my incumbent import at that time was Sean Chambers. So I can never take the credit for recruiting Sean. He was already there when I got there, but he was the only incumbent player that we had. He was the only player I had that was actually on that Grand Slam team in 1996. Yeah, well, now was, you're here. You're you the guys coach have been now. hand in hand, huh? Yeah. You, the, well, coach, my, my question to you is: you've been, you you were handed the reins in 1989 yes. um, with just uh, experience coaching um, a young team, not even in the pros, and now you're in this level. What was it like for you adjusting to the likes of the people around you? I mean, you had baby the loop on one end, playing coach Robert Jaworski on the other end. I mean, it must have been daunting to be up against well, these legends. Yeah, Norman Black actually was winning the Grand Slam that year in 1989, the year I joined. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a Grand Slam. They won the – San Miguel won all three conferences and won the Grand Slam. Uh, so he was like the guy at that moment that, uh, you know, he was setting the bar by winning that Grand Slam at that time. <clears throat> it was very intimidating because uh, the team I took over also uh, had like five guys that were older than me at the time. You know, Abed was there, Abed Kedabin, Yoya Biderman, Ricky Velosa. Um, uh, Ray Lazaro. Uh, it was a, it was a veteran team, um, and uh, uh, there was there was a lot of you know I wanted to come in there and treat them like I did those kids, you know, and <laughs> and, and and beat them up. And there was a lot of resistance in the beginning, and uh, uh, but you know, to my great fortune, uh, Fred uh, Oitensu really backed me up. I mean, he was really in my corner and. 
You know, he said to me, the first thing he said to me is, Tim, we want you to run this team like a business. We want it to be professional. And that has been the way that he has, you know, run it from the from from day one up to, you know, yesterday. It's always mm-hmm. been about uh, us being professionals and doing it the right way and, 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 right. Play, and doing it with integrity. And so um, that was his message from the very beginning. And I remember my first game, and I was just saying this to, uh, is it, uh, Miko Reyes. Um, my first game, you know, was in the ultra. Uh, we were playing in ultra. If you, and if people know that in the, the locker rooms are kind of underneath, they're kind of That's like right. in the basement. Mm-hmm. And then you have to walk up the stairs to go on to the court. And halfway up the stairs is a doorway that goes out to like the, the, the car path or the, you know, where the cars pass. And so it was halftime of my very first game and I was walking up the, I was walking up the stairs. And I, as I was going up, I looked to my right out the, out the door uh, and the thing. And I had two of my players were sitting there and it was two minutes to go before, half, before the game started. They were sitting there smoking cigarettes um, <laughs> at, at halftime during the game. They were out there smoking cigarettes. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it was more in 1989 through the 80s. It was almost like, a, like a, a hobby. We were practicing at 6 to 8 in the evening because we had guys that were still doing day jobs in 1989. Some of the guys were still doing day jobs. We had to wait to practice to 6 so guys could come to after work could come and, and go to practice. Well, not all of them, but, you know, like the 11th, 12th, 13th men, you know, like practice players and stuff, they were having day jobs. They weren't working. I mean, there wasn't a lot of money thrown around at that time. Uh, it wasn't big time salaries. A few, but I mean, big for that time, people would, would laugh at it now. Uh, but it was uh, it was not a, a real, you know, I mean, it, it, it was, the 90s started to change that. In the 90s, the, the, the the, the salaries went up, uh, the TV revenue went up, uh, you know, everything started getting bigger. And, and uh, um, I think the players started to realize that how special they were and what, how special you know, it was that they were able to play and, and they really wanted to keep those jobs. So it was, you know, the, the work ethic really started to step up, the conditioning really started to step up and uh, it became a lot more professional into the 90s. I have a question here, Coach. Um, who start, Who invited the triangle offense first? Was it you or Phil Jackson? Because you pretty much started at the pretty much the same time using that triangle offense. No, it was definitely Phil. Um, I used the Bulls. <laughs> I used the Bulls video that we used to. Uh, we tried to steal the video from Clark Air Base. You remember the Armed Forces Network? I don't know if you guys remember that. You probably too, too young. <laughs> But, FEN, uh, yeah. Coach. Yeah. I think it was called the network, FEN. But before that, it was yeah. the Armed Forces Network, right. or AFRTS. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then it became FEN. And uh, we couldn't get it locally unless you, like, put up a big antenna on the top of your house. Or I lived on a yeah. building at that time in Ross Boulevard. We used to go up and put this big, huge antenna up there, and we get this grainy picture of, uh, of Clark Air Base uh, 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 TV. And so... They would show the Bulls. They would show the NBA game of the week and whatever at that time. And so I would, I would put them on Betamax, not not VHS, but Betamax. And we would record on Betamax, and then I would fast forward, rewind, fast forward, rewind, and that's how I figured out how to learn um, the the triangle. And uh, to any coaches that may be listening right now, I have a one really important word of advice: Do not teach what you do not know. And I, I was teaching the triangle and I didn't know it. And I was trying to learn it myself and I had no idea. And I was trying to do it through 92 and 93 and basically almost got fired in 93 because we were so bad trying to run that, that triangle. But uh, uh, we persevered and we, we, we figured it out. And then we, uh, we started getting something out of it in 94, 95 and of course into 96. I didn't meet Tex Winter until 1999. That was the first time I had talked to Tex Winter. So um, the Bulls basically started the triangle, I think, in 89. And Tex was, of course, running the triangle since 1962. So 
Uh, he, he wrote the book, 1961 or 1962, I think it was, when he wrote the book. I have the book here. It's nicer looking now than it was then, but this is the book. Triple you see post it? offense, yeah. Triple yeah, post triple post, post offense. Post by, post. And this basically was written, the original copy was written in 1961, I believe. Well, 1962, I have to look it up again. But um, I always keep that book on my, on my desk all, at all times. I've been doing it through the years. But uh, um, so Tex was running this thing since 1960. So, and then Phil adopted it from him uh, during their summer league uh, time together when Doug Collins was still the coach of the Chicago Bulls, as we saw in the last dance. Uh, coach, why do you think um, not more coaches have picked up the triangle considering uh, Phil Jackson's success with it, uh, with the Bulls? Um, how come and the yeah, Lakers? Do think, don't forget yeah. the Lakers, too. Oh, yeah, and the Lakers, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> and the Aces that was, too. That was Phil, too. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was Phil, too. Yeah, and we won. Yeah. And the last, uh, if you think about it, through the years, you know, I, I ran it in the, in the pure text form from basically 1992 to or 1993, maybe it would be the purest form, would be 1993 to 2016. So Basically, we ran it, you know, for 23 years, and we won 18 championships running the triangle as well. I mean, the pure version, Bulls version, Laker version of that Tex winner triangle. If you're not running Tex winners triangle, then you are not running the triangle. Uh, I'm going to make that clear. You have to be running Texas triangle to be running the triangle. Um, so we did that purely for, for, for that length of time and won 18 championships. So, yeah, I, I think that's a really, really – legitimate question why didn't more coaches run it if it was always so successful we had great success there they had great success in the nba college teams were running it uh especially women's teams were really successful in the triangle but and i, I think there's a lot of theories out there but i think number one it's counterintuitive to what most mm -hmm. offenses are like in other words it takes a lot of breaking down of players and uh and building them back up uh for them to really get a feel for it it's a lengthy process it doesn't happen right away although i think dennis robbins said he, he learned it in one day um and uh i don't know who that was but that's what he said um but it, i just think that it also takes an, an enormous amount of uh, patience and enormous amount of repetitions over and over and over again. And it's been known as a coach killer because a lot of coaches have tried it. And mm -hmm. it's one of those, off, it's hard to explain, one of those offenses where you'll get to a certain level and you kind of won't know where to go from there. And uh, so you get stuck for a moment and it won't work for you because you got stuck. And then you'll revert back to what you did or what's comfort for you. So you kind of go away from it. So you go back to your comfort zone a little bit, and then maybe, oh, I'll go back to the triangle. But then you end up going back to the basic level again. You never jump to the, to the, to the, to the higher levels. And uh, um, I just think coaches don't have the, the backing behind them to be able to jump to that next level. Like I told you earlier, I almost got fired in 93 because I was trying to run the triangle. And Mr. Retention Fred didn't want me to run it. He, he told me at the time, you, you shouldn't be running this thing. You know, it's, it's, it's not working for you. You're, you're a better coach than that. And, uh, you know, um, but we stuck with it and we persevered. And just after he said that, we started to win. And, uh, um, and we started proving to him that, it, that, it, that it, we could win with it. But uh, if he hadn't had that patience, if he hadn't stuck with me through that time, that I never would have gotten to the level that we did with the triangle. And I think that is really the problem. Cotton Fitzsimmons, Fitzsimmons uh, mm -hmm. tried to do it uh, and, and couldn't get it done. Jim Clemens in Dallas tried to do yeah. it and couldn't get it done. Uh, uh, Kurt Rambis tried to get it done. Derek Fisher uh, in the New York Knicks tried to get it done in a pure sense with, with Phil Jackson overlooking them. And they still couldn't get it done. Uh, the New York press would not give him enough patience to allow him to get to that level where it was going to be effective. So it was a very, it's a very interesting dynamic. It's, a, it's an excellent question. It's a hard question to answer. Um, but you would think, you know, you would think that we'd all be running the triangle. I mean, look what, you know, 
Yeah, look what Steve Kerr did with the Warriors. I mean, everybody's doing what Steve Kerr did. You know, uh, why didn't everybody do what 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 uh, Tex and Phil did? I, I, it's hard to hard to fathom, but it's it's there. And um, um, but it's 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 not an easy office to learn. But once you learn it, it seems easy. It seems easy. Yeah. To learn. But coach, Actually, is, it, is it correct to say? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, is it correct? Would it be correct to say, sorry, Noel, is it correct to say that you have to have the right personnel to run that type of, of uh, offense? Because, you know, absolutely it, not. It's no, no, it can be it can be done with anybody. Huh? It can be done with anybody. I mean, that was <laughs> Texas big thing is that you in college, he ran his through his point guard. He had a really, really good point guard at Kansas State and they ran it all through through Kobe. I mean, through the point guard. Then you look at the Lakers. I mean, look at the Bulls. They ran it through Michael and Scotty. And then they changed the team around and they still ran it through Michael and Scotty. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with, with the Lakers, they did it through Shaq, the center position, uh, totally through Shaq. And they had Lamar Odom as their 6'10 initiator in the backcourt. Um, and then when Shaq left, they went back to running it through Kobe and then Powell and, and Andrew Bynum. So I'm not sure you can say that. And again, we've run it through 20 three years of doing it we did it with alaska with that group um and that's a group that we had to build because we didn't have that team at all we had to build it through the draft you know getting um uh johnny and and, and jeffrey and then through trades getting jojo and and boom getting put through the draft uh and then going to um sam mig where uh you know we had the core already there in place and we had to teach that core uh, from ground zero, you know, PJ, James, Ping, uh, you know, and, and, and luckily we had Joe that helped us do that, but, you know, it was a whole new core. So I hear that, Charlie, I hear that a lot. Oh, you have to have a Michael Jordan or you have mm -hmm. to have a, a Kobe Bryant, you know, and yeah, frankly, I just think it's a, a big pile of doo doo doo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> actually, actually, coach, I was about to say your biggest star in, in, in the 90s for Alaska, Jojo Lastimosa said he hated the triangle when you were starting to introduce it. Well, it, he was like Michael. I mean, when, yeah. when Michael, when MJ was with Doug Collins, every play was run through Michael That's Jordan. Right. So when you come in yeah. with a with an equal sharing offense, it's like, hey, I'm used to get, you know, 30, 40 touches, 50 touches a game. And now it might be 20. And it, your immediate reaction is, hey, you know, you should put the ball in the hands. I'm the best player. Why would you let that guy shoot it when he's only going to shoot 30% when I'm going to shoot it 60%? And that's the attitude that those players have. But you, you know, the, the thing that you have to make them realize is that one is, I love this expression, one is too small of a number for greatness. You don't do things on your own. You can't achieve greatness on your own. And, and Michael proved that. He, six years, he did not win a championship. Mm -hmm. And six years, they were saying he would never be a Magic. He would never be a Larry, uh, uh, a Larry Bird and make his teammates better and, and be a championship player because he was too selfish. He always did everything by himself. We had that problem also with, imagine James, James Yap. James, when he was with Ryan, you know, Ryan would run every play through James and James would get all these touches. And James was such a nice guy. He never complained. He never complained, never complained. It was amazing. And Jojo complained. You know, Jojo had that kind of personality. He's going to play. Yeah. Michael Jordan's going to complain. Kobe was complaining a lot in the beginning. But he, he was really angry that everything was running through Shaq and not through him in the beginning. And, uh, and he was happy when Phil Jackson left and he was able to play for Rudy Tomjanovic. And then they were terrible. And he goes, oh no, I need Phil back. I want to run the triangle again. So he asked for Phil back and they cut the triangle. They got Powell and Andrew Bynum, Lamar Odom, and lo and behold, he won another couple of championships. So um, the funny thing about the triangle is that there are guys who are resistant in the beginning to run it. We always had that resistance with imports oftentimes coming in because they wanted the ball in their hands all the time. But we were able to show them video of Kobe and Michael and, you know, doing different things and showing them how they could do it. So, you know, they kind of, that's how we got their buy-in. But there was always that resistance in the beginning. But I tell you, at the end, if every player I can think of, 
and I'm sure there might be an exception here or there, but every player I can think of that ran the triangle with us, every import that ran the triangle with us, when it was all done and, and over, when they were finished with us or they moved on to another team or they retired, they loved the triangle. They loved playing in the triangle. They really did. And I can honestly say that. And you look, you hear about Michael and Scotty and all those guys talking about the triangle now. No, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it's a, it's a fantastic thing. The thing that brings, I think most of all is it brings great camaraderie and it brings great chemistry because everybody's involved. Everybody's involved every moment of the, of the play. And so you don't feel left out. You don't feel like, Oh, I'm being overshadowed by Michael. I'm being overshadowed by Jojo. I'm being overshadowed by Johnny. There's, there's a sharing that goes on. And because of that sharing, there's a chemistry and a camaraderie that, that develops. And I think that that really helps the team eventually. Coach, what made you, what made Jojo change his mind? I mean, what was, uh, when did he winning. finally sign on? Winning. Winning. It's, it's all about winning. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he saw that they were winning. Um, it was, you know, Johnny had come to the team. Bo Hawkins had come to the team. Uh, you know, those guys were great players in their own right. Uh, you know, we, we picked up uh, uh, John John Cardell was there for a while. Um, and, you know, Portuino eventually got drafted along with Merwin Costello and Chris Bellado. But we started to put the pieces around JoJo. Before we did that, when I first came, and when we first got JoJo from Pure Foods through a trade with Boy Cabahu, which was negotiated totally by between Mr. Oitensu and Mr. Buhayim. Uh, we, I had no, it was strictly between the two of them. They made that trade and it was a great trade for us because we got a, a marquee player. Elmer Boykabog was just the nicest guy to have. And he was a great player, great shooter, but he wasn't that marquee guy that Jojo had, Jojo was. And if you remember Bong, uh, uh Bong Alvarez had torn his Achilles injury. So he was out almost the whole year. And so it was, and I remember this very distinctly and I, I wish I knew who did it, but there was someone in the press that referred to us at that time as Jojo and the 11 Little Indians. Now, that was our team. It was Jojo <laughs> and the 11 Little Indians. We did not go down the floor without Jojo touching the ball. It was not allowed. Jojo had to touch the ball. I mean, uh, he was so absolutely dominant in that team. And um, I thought that was a great I was upset with it at the time, but looking back, it was a great description of who we were, JoJo and 11 Little <laughs> Indians. Um, and uh, we had a play that we ran for JoJo probably 60, 70 times a game. I mean, it was amazing. And he would score. But it was a struggle being, you know, if you stop JoJo, I mean, if you, the whole game plan was about stopping JoJo. So if he didn't get it done, um, you know, he, he, you know, we didn't get it done. So it became harder and harder and harder for him to play. So when we got a Johnny and we got a Bong and we started getting the pieces and we started doing the sharing in the triangle, suddenly the game got easier and we started winning. And that's what convinced JoJo. And I can tell you what, that's exactly the same thing that happened to Michael. Michael started to see, that, yeah, hey, yeah. we can win this way. And uh, I can, you know, and, and for, first and foremost, JoJo is a winner. I mean, that's all he cares about yeah. is winning. Um, he doesn't care about numbers and points and whatever. He wants to win. Coach, oh, um, Joe, and there's another thing that Joe, Joe, uh, Joe has talked about. What did you? Uh, when we interviewed him a, a few days ago, uh, since we're on the topic of uh, of Jojo right now, and it was about his centennial team. Experience. Yeah, the angry game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were, were you, you read, able to read did, that? You, did you read it? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, so because <laughs> he, 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 he specifically told us to ask you about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, uh, not, not, not just the game, the whole trip to, to Bangkok. Um well, you know, it's it's it was the hardest thing I ever did coaching that team, without a doubt. I mean, uh, it, it still brings back uh a lot of emotion for me to talk about it. Um uh, it seemed like such a failure uh, because we didn't win the gold and we really set out to win the gold. And I, I really thought we could, and we didn't. And uh, um, uh, a lot of things went 
you know, that were difficult because I was, you know, I was, I was handling a, a superstar team, total superstar team, guys that all, at, you know, were used to averaging 40 minutes of basketball game yeah. and trying to get them to, to buy into, uh, you know, playing, you know, if you play five minutes, then you play the best five minutes you can. You play 30 minutes, you play the best 30 minutes. Didn't matter. You were going to do whatever it took uh, for win because it was bigger than all of us. You know, this, what we were doing was bigger than any one individual on the basketball team. We were playing for the country. And uh, that was the message. It was hard. And it was very difficult um, to, to manage all the eagles in there. Uh, some guys were really good about it. Some were, were some were, were, were not. Uh, I think that Jojo had the impression at that time that he felt, because he was my player, that I was going to play him more. Um, and I, I was of a, a different philosophy. I, I felt that because he was my player, uh, he would understand that and trust me that, that I, you know, that I would do the, uh, the right things for the team and that no matter what I did, because he was my player, he would go along with it. Um, and it, I just didn't understand that. He didn't understand that. And we just got kind of on two different sides of the coin. And, uh, uh, he got really upset about it and I didn't even know he was upset about it until, uh, till that actual game against Kazakhstan. I didn't even know that he was angry. Someone had told me, I, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was uh, Chut or Adik. I'm not sure. Um, but someone had told me that, that Jojo was very upset and, uh, um, and then he went out and we played Kazakhstan and uh, basically I went with the same lineup as I, I, as I had gone, it was very, very depressing because we were playing for third and we'd already gotten beat by China. And we, we had a chance to beat China in that game too. We, we had a, you know, we were down, uh, we were down, I think it was three points or two points. We were on a fast break. Um, Johnny was on a fast break, a two on one with Alan Kai Dick and they had one guy back and, uh, uh, and we thought that, Johnny was, we thought Alan was going to go for the layup and, jo and Alan and flared and Johnny thought he was going to lay up. So he, he threw the ball and, and Alan played out to the three and the ball went out of bounds. That was like uh, with a minute to go. And uh, they came down and hit a, uh, had a three point play. And then we missed, then he came down and hit another three, then he hit a three point shot. And that was it. That was the game. That was the last possession, but we were that close to beating China. And that was that great team of Wang Zhuzhu and Mank Batir. Yeah. <laughs> when they were awesome. That was, to me, their best ever China team, even the better than the Yao Ming's teams. Um, and, uh, and they hadn't lost in, in ages. But we had played Korea, and uh, Korea had, you know, I, I'm not going to go through that game because it hurt too much to think about it. <laughs> I've been trying to make up that game ever since. Um, but we got beat up in Korea. And I just didn't coach it well. Uh, I should have used our personnel differently. We had versatility in our personnel, and I didn't use it. Uh, um, I was so focused on China, I looked past uh, Korea. And uh, then, uh, you know, then we played China the next day and lost to them. That put us in the game for third. I play, playing the third for third is the hardest thing ever. That's why I'm glad they took – remember in the old days you used to have that playoff for third in the PBA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember that we we used to have a mm -hmm. there was a time when we had a five game playoff. Yeah, best serious. of five yeah. for third That's place. Right. That's, that's right. <laughs> then it went serious. down to best of three, and then it finally went down to a knockout game, and finally they knocked the it one out, game, knocked yeah, it out right. of park. Finally, you know, it was the third game. The play on playing for third is like the worst thing ever. You know, it's really hard to motivate anybody. You already feel like you're a loser. Um, you know, and then so I'm going into that game, uh, Kazakhstan, for them to place third was a, a, a tremendous achievement for them. And for us to place third, it was like, eh, you know. So it was a really tough game to get everybody motivated for, motivated for it. The good news was JoJo was motivated. And he was not motivated to win third. He was motivated to make a point to me. And, uh, um, and he went into the game, and he just went – Lot of wildfire. He was making shots from all over, and uh, um, we were actually losing to Kazakhstan when he came in. And he just, you know, led us to let us to like a three-point win or a three or five-point win. It was mm -hmm. close, and we almost lost that. 
And, you know, at the time, you know, I was devastated. Uh, um, uh, Jojo, I think, mentioned that I had cried, and I did. I, I, sorry, Jojo, it wasn't about you. <laughs> but, <laughs> I cried, I was angry at you or whatever, but it was, I was really devastated about the whole emotion of the, of the, of the, of the thing. I didn't go to the locker room after the after the Kazakhstan game. I didn't go in the locker room. I was just I was just feeling so bad, and uh, I'd never ever cried in any other game in my whole career ever. Uh, that was the only game I've ever cried. I'm just not a crier, and uh, I maybe cried two or three times in my whole life. And that was uh, my mother died, and and you know after that that series. So it was a just a uh, it's like an emotional release that I had over that whole experience. Uh, it was difficult. It was really, really difficult to, to lose that. And it was tougher because Jojo made it tougher because he was, he was so upset about it. So that made it tougher as well. And the next day at the airport, it was tough. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he still wasn't speaking to me. He didn't speak to me for, for, for a few weeks. Yeah, tough. he also mentioned that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a tough time. Yeah, it was a very, very tough time. Yeah. It wasn't like I wasn't speaking to him. He just wasn't speaking to me. Yeah. It was tough on me. It was tough on my wife. It was tough on everybody. Uh, the whole experience. Not just, I'm not talking about Joe, but the whole experience. And it's not something I, that I always talk about because it just brings back such tough memories, you know. And uh, uh, you want to talk about the Southeast Asian Games? <laughs> well, yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> but we'll get to that, Coach. I wanted to ask uh, all those years of, of running the triangle, all these players uh, under you. Did any player ever just quit on the triangle? I can't get it. I want out of your team. Trade me or don't sign me anymore when I when my contract expires. Did, did anyone come up to you to say that, or, or did it happen? You'll never believe who did that. Can you guess? Anybody? I'll get. I'll let you. I'll give you a guess. It's it. The Pure Foods team. You give me a guess? Wow. Wow, hold on. Noel. Uh, there you go. I'm thinking. <laughs> Were you thinking of someone who left? <laughs> yes. No, he didn't leave, actually. Oh, he didn't, he didn't leave, he but didn't. he wanted to leave. He was very upset and wanted to leave. Uh, Joe DeVance? No, it can't no, be. Not Joe. Oh, not Joe. James? James, yeah. Mark. Not Mark. James. James would, James. Even, even if James, if you know James, even if he wanted to leave, he would never say it. I mean, he's just too nice of a guy. He would never say it. He probably did want to leave at some point, but he, he, did, he would never, he was just too nice. I mean, James is like the nicest guy you'll ever, ever meet. I mean, uh, so pleasant to be around. But anyway, no, it wasn't James. My, 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 my guess, yeah, my guess is Mark Fingers. You're right. Oh, it's wow. Big, oh. Okay, okay. Mark, wow, I didn't know that. We'd like and to I hear about know that. that. at the time. He didn't come to me, obviously. He wouldn't come to me and just say, Coach, I want to get out of here. But, uh, uh, he went to our team manager, uh, Mr. Pardo, Renee Pardo, and uh, about a month into to my my little over a month, I think it was, uh, uh, he went over into Mr. Pardo and told him that uh, he wants to be traded because he he felt he would never learn the triangle, and he just didn't didn't think he could learn it. And uh, that point, that's I never I never really talked to Mark uh, a thing about it because uh, this is a story that was told to me through Mr. Pardo, so. Uh, um, uh, by the time I heard this, we'd already won the Grand Slam, so there was no reason to talk to Mark about it anymore. <laughs> but, uh, uh, apparently, he, he was really bothered by the fact that he didn't feel he could learn and that he might be better off moving to another team. And Mr. Pardo told me that he said, you know, give, give Coach Tim a chance, you know, just keep trying and working at it, you know, and, and let's, let's see where we can go. And ironically, I would say – in my career, probably the best person who executes, who really understood the triangle was Joe DeVance. I think it was Joe DeVance, mm -hmm. was really number one. Um, number two was probably Bone Hawkins. Bone Hawkins had a really good feel and understanding of the triangle. And I'm not including imports here, because Sean would be up there as well, but just local players. And I honestly feel that Ping would be number three. Wow. Ping got to a point where he understood the triangle better than anybody. And the great thing about Ping and Bong both is if you weren't running the triangle, if you were doing something on your own, they would let you know. They weren't afraid to tell you, hey, you know, get back to what we're doing. And that was really crucial to our success. Those two guys with that incredible buy-in and understanding 
and then making sure that everybody else towed the line and, and did their best in trying to stay with it. Uh, that was really crucial to our, to, to our winning. Coach, I want to go back to 1996 when you, when you won the Grand Slam. Obviously, when the first conference started, you weren't thinking Grand Slam. When you assembled that team in 96, Jeff is in his second year already. Everybody's already, um, you know, figured out how the offense works. Did you think that you would be so dominant for the rest of 1996? Well, if you remember, we won, night, we won the Governor's Cup in 1995. Yeah. So, you know, we were already had some momentum at that time. And, and uh, we were already feeling pretty good about ourselves. And then we got Je uh, I'm sorry, then, then – um, uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, stepped up in, in that in that second year. Oh, he also played a big role in '95. I have to admit, it, it was his second year. But um, it was just like we were starting to complete ourselves. Uh, the, another thing about the triangles: the triangle gets better the more you run it. The longer you run it, the more your understanding you have of it, and it kind of evolves. It it, it moves on itself. It, uh, uh, I said this uh, in a in a in a, in a video just a zoom just a couple nights ago when I was playing the triangle but it's like if someone does something defensively to stop what you normally do um, what the offense the offense would naturally counter into something else so if you're kind of trying to stop you from getting to that pinch action then it would counter and go somewhere else a natural counter and then you take that natural counter and you put it in your pocket you know you leave it in your pocket and then uh you know, it, and then you did you do something else? They they wouldn't want to pass the ball the wing, or they're trying to deny you know something else, and then you naturally counter. You get that one, you put it in your pocket. So after a while, you put all these things in your pocket, and you'd bring them out when you needed them, and the offense would build and build and build and build on itself. You got to remember, I never called the play. I never called you know play number one, play number two, you know nose, ear, whatever. I never called that. Uh, the triangle ran itself. Uh, players were totally dependent to run it on their own. So we had gotten to a level now and we had been to the finals uh, in 94, the first two conferences and lost, to, I'm sorry, 95, 94, sorry, 95. And we had lost the first two conferences to, uh, to Pop Cola. Uh, and then we, they were trying to get that grand slam in 95 and we won, we beat them in that in 95. Yes, with uh, Derek Pomodon was the coach. And so we already had, we were second, second, first, going into 96. And uh, um, so we had a really good feel for ourselves, I think. You know, the key was winning the Al Filipino. It's always the key is winning the Al Filipino. And uh, when we won the Al Filipino, I just felt that we, we started to feel like, you know, we could do something uh, special. We didn't really talk about it, but we felt that we could do something special. So it wasn't a shock, really, to us. Um, we were building to that to that moment, uh, but it's you know that that team was was so process oriented and so playing in the moment. They didn't really look beyond what they were doing, and that's what made them so so good. So they focused on the off Filipino, then they went in and played that really really tough series against Chito Narvasa and, and Shell. That was and really a tough series for Ken us. Redfield, yeah. Kenny yeah. Redfield, and we had a. You know, we had Derek Hamilton as our import, and then he got banned from the league, probably unjustly, but he got banned from the league, and Sean had to come in and take his place, and he was undersized, and we were able to win that really tough seven-game series. I will never forget that Richie Tixon turnaround jump shot from the corner that beat us in game six. We thought we'd already won the championship in game six. And then, you know, we started off badly in, in, in game in the third conference. I think we won our, lost our first two or three games, and then, we went on a 13 game winning streak and just, mm -hmm. you know, rushed through that uh, into home. the Grand Slam playing in Ebra in the finals. So um, I wouldn't say it was a surprise. I think it's a surprise anytime you win the Grand Slam, but uh, I felt that anybody could do it. This team could because of, uh, of their continuity, um, you know, and, and their, their togetherness. So there was a really together team. It was a really, a team of camaraderie ship. Uh, they were really special that way. I mean, they went out after every game and hung out. And uh, I've never had a team that hung out like these guys did. And I, again, I should say that was fostered by the organization and the culture, which was led uh, and, and decided by Freddie Intensive. Mm -hmm.
Well, you know, gentlemen, we're live on Facebook now. A bunch of guys uh, listening in to us. Jay Lopez, Mike Perez is there. And Coach Jude Roque is actually listening in. And he has a question for Coach right, Tim. Okay, the question of Coach Jude is, at any point in your coaching career, did you, when you were using the triangle, did you think maybe this isn't the right offense to run for this group of guys that I have? Should I change it? Well, yeah, we did that early. You know, obviously there's a lot of doubt. You know, we weren't being successful with it. And uh, and what I said is that when you're not successful, you kind of revert back to comfort zones. And and so I went back to stuff that I've written done in the past. And that just made it worse. It's because you were, you were like jack of all trades, master of nothing. You were kind of doing a little bit of triangle, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And that never, ever worked. So, you know, when we fully committed to it, that's when we started to, to get better and uh, got to that point of 96 and into 98. I actually think the 98 team was better than the 96 team. Yeah. Uh, so also what yeah. Joel has said. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about that. Go ahead. Yeah, but anyway, um, but uh, obviously, you know, the last five years, uh, four years, I should say that, you know, we have moved away from the pure triangle and try to create an offense with tri triangle principles. And uh, um, so, you know, and we did that a lot because of personnel and just because the game was kind of evolving and we wanted to try to catch up to the game in terms of tempo and, and, and three point shooting and, and things of that sort. So we, we kind of went away from the triangle starting in 2016 or two, you know, between 2017, we went back and forth for a little bit, but you know, now we've settled into uh, what we're doing now. But so, yeah, there was always times that there's doubt, but through the, between maybe 94 and 2000, you know, 15 or 16, no, I, I really can't say that I had any doubts of whether I should be running the triangle or not. I had so much success with it and I always had to, just find, you know, it's a versatile offense, so you can do a lot of different things with it. And we, we you know, we, we, did a, we, we did it in a versatile way, but depending on what kind of import we had and such, but uh, generally we always played the triangle and it was just a matter of trying to get buy-in for the players. I have a question, Coach, about that 98 team. You said mm -hmm. it was actually probably the stronger team as opposed to the uh, 96 team because you did have a Kenneth Duremdes, you had Rodney Santos already on that team. And Giorgio Lastimosa actually said, was, uh, was telling you, don't include me in the Centennial team because we have a chance to win a Grand Slam if you leave me with Alaska. Uh, what was the thought process going into that final conference when you were so close to winning a Grand Slam, but you also had a patriotic duty with the Centennial team? To me, it was not even a decision. I mean, it, was, it wasn't even, I mean, I, I look back on it and I have absolutely no regrets. I regret that we didn't get the gold, but I certainly don't have regrets that we didn't get the grand slab. I just, I, I, I find it uh, hard to believe that anybody would basically, you know, equate the grand slam to uh, the national team. And uh, so it never, it never even really occurred to me. I do remember Jojo coming up and saying, uh, but I thought it was more of, you know, come on, Joe. I mean, come on, coach. Let's, let's just try to win the Grand Slam. Uh, I didn't think it was as serious as, as he, he made it out to be. And maybe he was. I just took it differently. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, to me, it was, it, it was a no-brainer. And it was an opportunity that, you know, comes once in a lifetime to coach and, and to have the backing that they gave us and, you know, the ability to travel and, and uh, play in the United States against all those we played against the who's who of coaches in the, in the United States when we took our tour in, in the college tour and, and uh, Jones Cup. And I mean, to me, that was so much more exciting than ever winning a Grand Slam. So um, it would just, it, to me, it, it's, it's not even a, a true question. It, and uh, uh, we, you know, we did our thing, win 98, and, and we got to play, we had to play against Ron Jacobs twice in that uh, the first conference and the second conference. Uh, it played San Miguel twice in the finals. Mm -hmm. And that to me was like the, the ultimate test was, was coaching against Ron Jacobs. Uh, and uh, so 98 was a good year. It was mm -hmm. just a tough ending just because of the, uh, the bronze medal instead of the gold. Now we look up back on it and we go, wow, we want a gold. I mean, we want a bronze medal. That's so my wife says, you know, Tim, why do you feel bad about that? You want a bronze medal, you know? 
And at least you won a medal. And I said, boy, you just, it was to be there at that time. Yeah, bronze was nothing. Now it looks back, it's all right. But back then, oh, it was nothing. So again, I, I never gave it really any thought. And I don't think Mr. Retenso gave it any thought as well. I think that we were all on board. Maybe the only one that wasn't on board was, was Jojo. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, Jojo was a real important part of what we wanted because we needed him to help us get buy-in for all the other superstars. That was basically, you know, one of Jojo's and Johnny's and, and Bone Hawkins role. The, the bad news was, and I thought this really affected us in 98 and maybe prevented us from winning that gold is that we lost Bone Hawkins to an ACL injury in the second conference. Right, right. He was already on the team and uh, we lost him to that. And, and he was a guy that I relied on uh, incredibly. As you know, as I said earlier about him, the knowledge of the triangle and keeping everybody in line, he would have been a, a tremendous boost, uh, uh, almost another coach on that team if he had been able to play in 98 and the Centennial team. So, but to me, again, it wasn't, wasn't really a, a question of whether we, we stay and do the goal and do that thing. And, I, and as it turned out, you know, I mean, Jojo by himself there with Alaska, I don't know if they would have been able to win the, the, uh, the championship anyway uh, in the third conference um, without Bone and Johnny and, and Kenneth uh, there with them. I couldn't certainly couldn't leave all four of them there to win the grand to play the grand slam <laughs> and go to the team without them. So uh, uh, it was either basically it was all or nothing. Coach, in the in your several final series that you've played against the, some of these great coaches in our league, there have been some sort of uh, I don't know maybe shy wars going on, some verbal tussles with some of these guys, and it was recorded in the news and all of that. Was there ever a time that you engaged in these sci wars, uh, what they call sci wars, and you came to regret it? Like you said, you know, it might have might have uh, hit me in the back because, you know, the other coach responded accordingly, and then you weren't able to respond, uh, you know, in kind. Uh, well, I remember, I remember a time, and it wasn't finals. I don't think it was just a regular game uh, with Sonny Jaworski. You know, as I said earlier, one of my heroes. Um, there was a time I'm trying to remember exactly how it went uh, but at the end of the game I was really mad at the referee and so kind of in protest I told our players to freeze the ball even though we were losing and uh, uh, and it didn't look good and uh, um, I believe I got fined in the, in the, by the league. I can't remember whether I did or not. Uh, and we just froze the ball and didn't take a shot, even though we were losing. And uh, uh, it took a 24-second violation. And it was just kind of, a, I was protesting the referees. I had nothing to do with with, uh, with, with Sonny. And in the, uh, it was at Astrodome. And in the hallway in the back where all the locker rooms was, I was leaving and I went by Uh, Sonny Jaworski to congratulate him for the win and to tell him that, you know, I'm sorry about, you know, what I did because, uh, you know, it wasn't about him. It wasn't about mm -hmm. a never. It was, you know, about, it was really a protest about the referees. But before I could even say anything, he learned, he turned to me and said, I have lost all my, all my respect for you as a coach. And then he turned away and I was crushed. I was broken, uh, really, really hurt. And, uh, I, I, you know, slunk my way out of the lot, out of the, out of the Coliseum mm -hmm. and found my way to the car. And, uh, but that was that, that I, I remember that because it was so painful for mm -hmm. him to say that to me. And, uh, uh, but I mean, that, that didn't last. I mean, over the years we've, 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 you know, we've made up and we're, we're, you know, I wouldn't say we're best friends, but we're, you know, we're very good friends. And, uh, um, That and and I'm sure there are other ones. Uh, there was the uh, dolphins and sharks. I don't know if you remember that one in Chita Narvasa in the Grand Slam year. My daughter always refers to it, uh, so I, I always have it in my mind. Um, you know, I don't remember that that particular conference was a weird conference because if you remember, 
Kenny Redfield, who was playing for Shell at that time, he made a half court shot mm-hmm. in the semifinals to yeah. knock he never out. Yeah. And he never had been winning that game the whole way. They'd been winning that game the whole way, and they were the favorite team, and there was just, you know, no way Shell was going to win. You know, there's no way the referees are going to allow Shell to win. You know, they, the league wanted he never into the in the finals so they could have the big crowd. You know, you always hear all that stuff. And so we were all locked into that. We were waiting for that game to finish. We were already in the finals, Alaska was. And so we were waiting. We were all 1,000% sure that we would play in Ebra. And it was kind of like, you know, be careful what you wish for. You know, we, we knew, we didn't think Shell was as strong as it never was. And we would have to deal with the crowd. So I guess it was a feeling that maybe we wanted to play against Shell rather than Nebra. And then Kenny Redfield hits that, that shot at half court and wins the game um, yeah. outright. And it was like a big shock to everybody. And it was like, be careful what you wish for. Suddenly we got Shell instead of an Ebra. Well, in game one, we played Shell, they beat us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all of a sudden we're down the series. And, you know, uh, and we were so caught up to one, thinking we were going to play in Ebra and all these big crowds. All of a sudden the crowds didn't show up and the intensity level wasn't there. So we played game two and we sneaked, snuck out a win in game two. And, uh, um, and then they won game three, they went up 2 one. And still the crowds were not there. I think everybody was so disappointed that didn't win or didn't play that nobody came to watch. And then uh, suddenly after game two, uh, game four, we won game four. And it was 2-2. And I turned around to the press right after the game, you know, they, they interviewed the coach right after the game. And I said, right then and there, I said, we are like sharks in the water. I said, this series is over. This is 2-2. And I'm saying this series is over. We're going to sweep the next game. Shell's not going to get another game. We are like sharks. And we smell blood. We're like sharks in the water. And so it comes out in the papers the next day. Sharks are in the, you know, Alaska says there's sharks. Series is going to be over. And, uh, um, and then Chito Navasa comes out and says, well, if there's sharks, we're dolphins and we kill dolphins. I mean, we kill sharks. He goes, we kill sharks. And so the next day in the paper, the <laughs> dolphins versus sharks. <laughs> and, you know, in those days, Flipper was the big show and Flipper would always go over and kill all the sharks for all the, all the, all the little kids that were in the water. So it was dolphins versus sharks. And then I, we went out and we won game five. And everybody was saying, ah, Tim's crystal ball, you know. He knew what he was saying. Da, 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 da. And then Richie Tixon makes that shot in game six and beats us. <laughs> and uh, and I'm saying, oh, my gosh. And then everybody says, you know, uh, what happened, Tim Cohn? You didn't win. You know, you shall won. And it was like it was like the worst thing that ever happened. And and they asked me about game seven. I said, I'm, I'm no longer doing I'm no longer looking into my crystal ball because it doesn't mm-hmm. work. Obviously, my crystal ball <laughs> broke in game six. And uh, we went out and, and, and snuck game seven out. It was a close game. We, we won. And uh, terrifically, it was one of the hardest series that I'd ever coached. And it was supposed to be the easy one. And, you know, once you start thinking it gets easy, <laughs> it's easy, yeah. it gets hard in a hurry. And it got hard in a hurry in that series. But I'll never forget that with Chito and I going back, sharks and dolphins, sharks and dolphins. <laughs> That's all part of the gamesmanship, coach. Yeah, my lo- my wife, have- my daughter, who was of age, she was maybe you know, maybe 12 or 13 at that age. She loved that, you know, sharks and <laughs> dolphins. And she's like 28 years old now, and she still talks about it all the time, the sharks and dolphins series. Yeah, <laughs> I'll never forget that one. Noel. Of course, yeah, Chito but- becomes the, the commissioner a few years later. Yeah. <laughs> I had to apologize to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, an import, you have an import question? Yeah, I, I do. I actually have an import question. I mean, who, which import you, you've coached has made the biggest impact to your team? Would it be, I'm narrowing it down to two imports. Would it be Sean Chambers or Justin Brownlee? Or even Marcus <laughs> Blakely, for that matter? Uh, um, is this over yet? Can we, can we go on? <laughs> can, I, can I sign off now? <laughs> I Your three names, though, three names instead of two. You got to remember, Sean came to me when I was really, really young, you know, and I needed that kind of support from a guy like him. Uh, you know, he uh, without him, I never, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. Sean was was everything. Remember, he was the only guy that was incumbent 
uh, that I had that made that Grand Slam team. We built that Grand Slam team, you know, Fred and Walkie, Trillo and, and myself over the years through trades and draft picks and, and but Sean was the constant through all those years. And he, he you know, we won, a, we won six championships with him. You know, he's still the number one winning, winning his championship uh, 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 import of all time. And uh, so he was incredibly special. Um, it's been really nice to have a Justin this late in my career. And, you know, he actually was the one that brought me out of the triangle a little bit, maybe do things because yet yeah, he was such a special talent. We want to do a couple other things with him. And, uh, um, it, they're, they're two peas in a pod. Uh, they are both so incredibly likable, but for different reasons. Sean is much more boisterous and talkative. He's so much fun to be around. Um, you know, he'll crack jokes and, and uh, he'll be with anybody. I don't care. I remember being in the airport with him. We were doing a scouting trip together and we were at the airport and we sat down and there was a lady, an older lady, I mean, probably my age now, but she seemed older at that time. I was maybe only in my thirties or at that time. And we sat down and she probably maybe been the 60 or 70. And Sean turns to her and just starts picking up a conversation. He didn't know her from Adam just starts talking to her. And that's what Sean was all about. Sean would talk to anybody anywhere and he would be your best friend in, in, in a moment, you know, and uh, he had such an infectious personality and that, that went over the whole team. And I never worried about chemistry, anything that we had problems with chemistry when, when Sean came in, because I knew that he would take care of it. He would figure it out. Uh, he would, you know, he would go over and smooth the feathers of Jojo or, you know, or, or, you know, you know get, Bone would be mad at me for two a days and he'd go, Bone, come on, you could do two a days, you know, stuff like that. But he would never have a chemistry problem with Sean around. Justin is also an incredibly nice person in a very, very different way. He's extremely quiet. You know, he, he doesn't talk a lot, but he is a giggler. He giggles all the time and he giggles and laughs at any joke. I don't care how dumb it is, how bad it is or whatever. He will <laughs> laugh. He loves to laugh. And uh, that just makes him so fun to be around all the time. And, uh, um, and he's such an incredible player. And he's so incredible, incredibly hum humble. He just doesn't know how good he is as a basketball player, you know. Um, and he is that good. And he's that good of a person. So it's really hard to choose between the two of them. And another guy can peach there is Marcus Blakely. Marcus Blakely was an incredible guy to have around as well. You can't, you know, Marcus, you know, was, was, uh, won two championships with us in that grand slam year. I mean, in that grand slam street with four championships, mm -hmm. two of them were his. Uh, and, uh, he was an incredible guy also. And for another different reason, you know, different personality completely from the other two, but also very nice. So I've been blessed with, with, with a lot of really nice imports. One of the funniest imports I also had was Dickie Simpkins talking about the last dance. I don't know if you remember Dickie Simpkins. Yeah, of course, uh, yeah. yeah. He played yeah. with the Big Chicago guy. Bulls and was part of that last dance. And, uh, um, you know, I've seen him on a couple of, you know, just on the side of a couple of uh, videos in the last dance. And he was the only pimp import I ever had that knew the triangle uh, when he came in. Knew the triangle as well as I did, maybe even better than I did when he came in as an import and uh that was a real special time and he told the stories and uh, uh it was a lot of fun having him on the team Cy Young, he he hurt us back in the in the, in the quarterfinals uh he could all barely stand up but he fought through it and tried to win for us but we got knocked out by uh red bull i think it was at the time what were his comments on the uh, how you ran your triangle coach uh, did he give well, the inputs as well yeah, he gave us inputs, but you know we ran it exactly the same way that Tex ran it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it was yeah. it was carbon copy. Uh, mm -hmm. He stepped in; it was like you know, piece of cake for him. He was surprised at how how we ran it. Um, the thing is, it was just such a seamless uh, entry, as opposed to the imports. You had to come in and go through the herky jerkiness of learning it. We had to show him video. We had to go through all the steps, and um, and it was always a learning curve. But for Dickie, it was so similar. It seems, I remember he came in as an import. He came in for Leon Derrick or Leon something. Uh, he came in as a, sorry, Leon, I should remember your name. But he he came in as a, as a, as a replacement 
And we had lost like our first three games or we were like one and four or something like that when he came in and then immediately he stepped in and we went on the winning streak. And, uh, and again, it was just so seamless to have him have a there. Coach, we have a, we have a couple of uh, standard questions we ask our guests, but before we get to that, there's a question on the FB live uh, feed from mm -hmm. Jay Lopez. You know, because Noel did mention it earlier that you, you, well, you mentioned it earlier, the SEA Games, you wanted to talk about that. That's the experience of coaching the Philippine team once again in a much better situation. But the question actually is, what's the future of Philippine basketball as you see it now? Is it European style? Is it, what you know, what's the right way to, to go forward? Well, I think a lot of it, again, is going to depend on the coach. You know, if you bring a European coach in, you're going to play a European style. And um, and to me, it's not, you know, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's not one way that's going to be successful. Um, what's going to be successful is a guy coming in and having a commitment to the program and having the country committed to the program, the powers that be, uh, be committed to the program and have a level of continuity uh, and be able to be not successful in the beginning, you know, and, 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 and have failure uh, because you don't have success without failure. You just don't step in and have success. It doesn't happen. It never does. And uh, Michael Jordan is, is a story, I mean, uh, of all that. Um, and so it's really going to come down to me, con to continuity and support uh, to whoever it is that takes over that team. Um, and I, I think talking to Al Panlilio and, and being a part of that program for that very short time, I think they, they have that in mind. I think that message is clear. And I think now, I think that would have been more clear had we not gone to this level, right? Uh, that we're, you know, the coronavirus right now. You're going to wonder how long it's going to take before we get back to, you know, PBA, much less international, you know, inter international. That could be a long time in coming before we get back to playing internationally because, you know, the protection of borders and whatever. Um, so, uh, but that's going to be set back a little bit. But, the setback will always also give us more time to think on it and and uh, and to get a better pathway and plan in, in place. But again, to me, it's all about continuity. And I mean, there's maybe 15 coaches out there, um, probably more. A lot of coaches out there we don't even know of that could come in and do something really good with our program. But you know, it's it it does it's not the, necessarily the coach. It's going to be the support. Because again, there's more ways, more more ways to one skin cat. Uh, I don't think there is a European style of play anymore. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think the NBA has already adopted that European style of play. Uh, I think there's a lot of teams that are out there running it. I think Popovich had, had a real good feel for European play many years ago. I think that's a that's a that's a, a, a style or a name that's that's out of vogue already. I, I don't think that's. I don't think there's a European or an NBA style of play now. Um, I think there's like a, you know, uh, all the coaches are pretty much coaching the same way. The three-point shooting, the, the tempo up the floor, uh, big man, you know, playing on the perimeter, opening up the, the paint for penetration and, and sets. And you look at the sets people run, they're all very similar. Uh, um, it's, 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 you know, it's been revolutionized already. The game always evolved, but I think we're in a cycle right now where it's pretty much the same. All right. Well, hey, coach. well I have, I have a, one, one more question before we go to our standard questions, uh, Coach Tim. And I'm sure you've been asked this millions of times already before. Um, what was your favorite Grand Slam team? Was it the 96 or the 14? Yeah, it's like, you know, people ask me about that with my, my, the championships, you know, and which championship did you like the most? Uh, ones that are most memorable, you know, both Grand Slams are incredibly memorable. They were, they were done very, very differently. Uh, we talked about the 96, you know, we, we basically, except for that little blip in against the uh, shell team, we pretty much dominated throughout that whole, that whole year ended with a 13 game, you know, winning streak and beating, you know, he never four games to one. Uh, uh, there wasn't really much challenge at that point. Uh, but if you look at the Sam Sam Mig uh, Grand Slam, I mean, we placed like fifth and then sixth and then fourth or something like that uh, in every conference, and 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 uh, there was no break between any of the conferences because they were all compressing everything, so we didn't have a chance to recover. 
think the second conference we went and won, and then we played three days later into the next conference already. So, I mean, it was, it was really trying and uh, uh, we, you know, we were high flying with Alaska, but with, with Sam Mig, it was like, you know, you know, wrenching every little piece of sweat and blood that we had to try to get that grand slam. And if you remember the last game, my gosh, I mean, uh, the last play of the game, I mean, Paul Lee was wide open for a three that could have, that would have won it. We were up by two. He shot a wide open three and missed it. And then, um, uh, uh, then the ball got rebound and then Jeff Chan got another mm-hmm. wide open three. I mean, absolutely wide open. Nobody would buy him <laughs> and he misses it also. I mean, Paul and Jeff, the two best shooters in the league. And then they get the, the ball goes out of bounds. It's still their favor. They got three seconds to go. They get the ball into AZ Reed. AZ Reed jumps from the three point line, shoots it. And I thought for sure it was going in and it hits the back of the rim. hits the back of the rim and balances out and we win the grand slam. I mean, it was, I mean, how much was the difference between winning and losing? And uh, so, you know, it took every little thing that we had, every little luck, every little, you know, blessing that we had from, from the Lord. Uh, I mean, and, and the, the perseverance of those guys, it was, it was really amazing to win that. So each one had its very definite personality. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, grand slams, they have to work the right, everything has to go your way. You know, I think Sam Miguel this, this year was the, was the ultimate, you know, example because, you know, they had it all going. It looked like they had a great import. Des Wells in the third conference, they were on the roll. But, you know, just one thing happens and bam, it's gone. That's and, right. that, you know, they had that little practice there and changed the whole course of their, of the fact of winning the Grand Slam. It happened also to Pop Cola in 1995. They had a problem with their import in, in 1995. And I think it was a contract problem or, or with a teammate or something similar to what happened with Sam Miguel and that that card that broke their whole thing and they didn't win the Grand Slam. Mm-hmm. That's the beauty of having Sean Chambers. It gives you a chance to win Slam. <laughs> and you know, having a Marcus Blakely who'd already won a championship with us, you know, we knew who he was what he was all about and gave us a chance to win that third conference. So we were blessed. Okay. Yeah, coach. Uh... I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, bring us home. We've got two standard questions for all of uh, our guests. Uh, first off, a little background here. I'm going to ask you who was, who's your toughest, who has been your toughest uh, coaching opponent? Now, we asked this question of... Yeah. Uh, I said, all the I... other coaches said it's you. Yeah, yeah. all of the other coaches we interviewed, yeah, right. Coach Jong, Coach Yang, yeah, Coach right. Norman. Coach yeah. Tim. Yeah, they all said it was you. Oh, uh, you. So we'd like to throw that question to you. It's really difficult for me, man. I've you know, been to, what, 30 finals appearances? So 30, <laughs> 34 finals appearances. So I've gone up against a lot of coaches. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's the guy I had the least success against. I guess that's who I would measure mm-hmm as the guy I had the least success against. I mean, I would say Chuck was really hard for me. He knew me inside and out. Chuck Reyes knew me inside and out. I've been coaching as Norman Black for years and years and years. Uh, Yang Gao, you know, was uh, a polar opposite of the way I coached. So it was always a real clash of philosophies. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Ron Jacobs, but he was in the league for such a short time. But my utmost respect for for, for Ron and by extension, Jung, because Jung was very much like Ron. Um, so, you know, Sonny Jaworski and, and all that he brought, maybe the Lupin, but I only got to play against him once. But the guy probably that I have to say that I had the least amount of success is, is Ryan Gregorio. Ryan oh. beat me up all the time. He wow. beat me up. Beat me up. Oh, he's gonna three, gloat about that the whole year. I had a three <laughs> game, I had a three games to one lead in the semifinals, and he came back and won three state and beat me. We had swept <laughs> Ginebra four games to zero in the semifinals. We played Pure Foods in the finals. We were flying high. He swept us four zero in the finals. <laughs> I mean, all the toughest moments. And I, I remember we had a thirty two wow. point lead against Ryan Gregorio. Uh, and he came back and beat us in that 32-point game. So, 
you know, he just had my number. Here's my contrapelo. You know, I don't, I don't know if we want him to find out about this, but uh, I hope he's not watching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm going to message I've, him right I've now. It, no, I've said, it to, I've said it before that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've actually said it to him before that you know, he, he, he gave me more problems than any other coach. Just, I mean, I had the least mm -hmm. amount of success. I had, I had bad success against Yang and Chot and, and Norman and all those guys, but not like, not the hurting really painful ones uh, by Ryan. Yeah. Really? Very interesting answer, Coach. Go ahead, but, uh, Yeah. The last question we have is, uh, who are your top five favorite players of all time? I hate answering those questions. That you've coached. <laughs> that you've coached. You know, that you've as coached. soon as you say it, there's always someone you're leaving out. You know, you, you cannot, you know, I've been in the league 30 years. How many players yeah. have I coached? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been involved in 34, uh, 34 finals appearances, you know, so th there's a lot of yeah, players yeah. that have been involved. For you, that's that stuff for you. It's a tough question for me. It really is. I mean, I will, I will. You can throw in a sixth man if you want. I will say ultimate, you know, I will say that, that uh, Johnny, <laughs> Johnny Abariantos deserves to be there. But mm -hmm. uh, beyond Johnny, I don't want to say anymore. <laughs> 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 I really don't want to say anymore. Um, I mean, how, how do you compare Bong? How do you compare Bong the five? How about the five guys? Mark Fingers. How do you compare James Shap with Jojo Lastimosa? You know, I mean, you can go through these, you know, all these things all the way through. But penultimately, I mean, the, the ultimately, Johnny, you know, was the best. I mean, you know, but even though you guys kind of throw in L.A. there as well, you know, all the sections that we've had with L.A., but still Johnny was the best. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's easy to say Johnny. It's hard to say everybody else. Really. I say, say coach that, yeah, Johnny Abrientos is the best player you've ever coached. I would say so. I would say so. And I'm, I'm sorry for the other guys, but I would just, you know, I think Johnny deserves that mantle of being the best that I've ever right. coached. And I think he's one of the all time. I think he's, you know, and I know Hector Kalmer very well. And I always apologize to Hector. I always apologize to him. But I say, <laughs> Hector, you know, Johnny was the best point guard ever. And now I have to apologize to Jason Castro as well. But uh, Jason was more of a points guard. So uh, Johnny, I think, was the greatest point guard ever. And maybe one of the greatest players of all time. I just think that he was small, so he doesn't get included with the Fajardos and Juan Fernandez's and all those guys, but he was truly special. And to be around him, like I was, I knew how special he was. Hey, we, we need to have another, Ooh. we need to have another session with coach Tim. That's not, this is not enough. That's loaded. We'll invite you again soon, you know, if you have time. <laughs> okay. I'm really happy to, have time to talk, talk about all the about, things. Uh, pure food in the Nepro next time. It'd be fun. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. we could. And, uh, I'm, I'm and a lot Centennial of other team. stuff. Uh, I mean the uh, the Southeast Asian games. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We left that out though. <laughs> well, if you want to add something now, coach, if you want to talk about something. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the no, team. no, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, you you get me going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <no. laughs> You're gonna be here another hour. That's why it's ripe. It's ripe for a part two. You no, know, soon. But, exactly. Yeah. For uh, Ariel Vanguardia had me on for a uh, uh, triangle thing that I did for yeah, him yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. a couple nights ago, and, and it was supposed to be last night, a couple nights ago. I was supposed to be on for an hour and a half. Supposed to How be long? on for an hour and a half. How long did it last? I went on for three hours. Right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's what, hour and we can, we can go as long as that right now. Guys. So I, mean, I just couldn't shut up. And my players are always telling me that. Why don't you just shut up sometimes, coach? I can't shut up. I just blab and blab and blab and blab. No, well, I'll Three ask stories. you right now, Coach, about that. Uh, since I'm already intrigued. Yeah. The Southeast Asian Games team was, uh, how would you compare that with the Centennial team? Oh, um, we Man built it very similar, similarly. Um, you know, we, we try to get a core of Alaska players to join the Centennial team. Mm -hmm. We try to get a, I'll try to be as quick as I can. We did a core of, uh, of, of Hinebra players to join the national team and then got guys that we fit uh and i went for veterans back in the day uh you know we had like nick velasco i think danny siegel might have been there already and we didn't choose those guys we wanted to go with a veteran crew same thing with this you know we had a we felt we were we were imparting teaching a, a difficult system and we felt veterans would get to know it better than than the younger players and we so we we set took that same 
kind of plan and brought it forward in, into you know 20 30 years later and uh um and you know we had such a we had like a we had less than a week to really prepare for that uh, we had one day one practice a day for like five practices and then i think we had eight practices going into the southeast asian games but you know it was a different level of competition you know we knew the competition was going to be able to compete with us and uh um, but it was it was so much fun to coach June Mar and and Chris Ross and you know, the San Miguel guys and Matthew Wright and and all those guys that uh, Vic Manuel you know it was just a real treat to to get to know those guys on an intimate level uh, see them in the locker room see them at halftime see them do their pregame thing you know have them looking at me while I'm talking about the game plan it was just a big thrill. And I know in the big scheme of things, it wasn't a big thing because we were supposed mm -hmm. to go out and win. But uh, I tell you, I had a lot of nervous moments. I don't know why, looking back, <laughs> before those games started, I was running to the bathroom and my stomach was turning. And, and uh, but, you know, our guys were just too good. And, uh, and, and looking back on the experience, it was just awesome one of the best funnest times I ever had. It, it really helps when you win, you know, mm -hmm. it really, and it really helps when you win by 30 points every night. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun for us to watch too. Yeah. In front of a home crowd too. Yeah. yeah. In front of the home crowd as well. So, and it meant a lot. It meant a lot to, to me to get, have another opportunity to do that, uh, to have some success after the failure that we had in, uh, in the Centennial team. I didn't, I didn't have to deal with a JoJo in, in the Centennial team. <laughs> <laughs> there was no pressure that we were winning every game by 30 points. So we could play every, everybody was like, oh, I don't care if I play or not. Because they, <laughs> they knew that we were going to go out there and beat everybody. Anyway. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ellie, yeah. Ellie wasn't going to complain. Yeah. Ellie wasn't going to complain. You had to play uh, that. No, no yeah, in fact, I think there was one well, I game where. Out, I did yeah. take out uh, two you know, players from the team. I, mean, I cut yes, the yes. two, uh, two Inebra players. Mm -hmm. um you know scotty and and art and it was mm -hmm. really really tough yeah. you know but I, I went into the i was a little bit smarter this time because i knew that happened to jojo in the past when i came in with the inebra players i explained the whole situation to him i said there's a chance you may not make the team i said but I'm, i need you to be my coaches i need you to be my coaches on the floor i need you to be the guy that's going to teach this help me teach the system and that's your your main thrust it's not going to be playing and winning It's going to be that thrust of going out there and coaching. And that's something I didn't communicate to my Alaska players. Uh, and, and that might have changed things a little bit more. It might have opened, every, opened everybody's eyes a little bit more. So when I told Scotty and, uh, and Art that they weren't going to make the team, they were okay with it. They were really, really, really good about it. And they were the two young guys on the team anyway. So it was, it was, it was more logical to let them uh, go. But I, it was easier – telling them than having to turn around and tell two San Miguel players or, you know, two talking text players or something like that, that I don't really have a relationship with mm -hmm. that, Hey, you're not good enough to be on this team, you know? And that wasn't the point of my never players. It wasn't about being good enough or bad. It was really about the knowledge and the teachability. So, and they understood that. So it was, it made that whole situation so much, so much easier and better. I wish I'd been smarter when I was younger. I would have done that uh, earlier in 1998 but then you guys have nothing to talk about with jojo so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that was our number one article last week yeah, exactly <laughs> the, the angry uh, joe was angry very angry pleased game. with it too i was very pleased oh, with thank it you not <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> No, I was kidding. I wasn't pleased with it. But I mean, that, that's, that's reporting. I mean, uh, obviously, I've mm -hmm. never been pleased with everything that's ever been written. But it was, it was a little painful. But, you know, I got over it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we were also surprised by jo uh, Jojo's answer. Uh, yeah, what, what, well, that, what that was, said during that, that was Jojo and my relationship. Jojo and I, were we butted heads all the way through our mm -hmm. careers mm -hmm. together. And he was a... And that's what made him such a tremendous leader. He had that great strength of, of you know, personal personality. He, he was a, he's a very strong minded, very strong talking uh, person. And he, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. He talks 
uh, uh, brutally honestly. I mean, he will never not let you know what he thinks. And again, you, that's a, the, the, the qualities of a great leader, especially in basketball. And uh, he was our unquestioned leader throughout that whole time. And, and because he was a leader and I was a leader, we kind of butted heads at each other all the time because he had very strong opinions of how things should be done. And I obviously had strong things and, and uh, we butted heads and screamed and yelled at each other a number of times. And, and, but we always got through it. He didn't hold the grudge. I didn't know. At least he didn't hold a grudge for too long. Obviously he held that fun for a while, but uh, you know, we, we got past it and, you know, winning and, and doing uh, playing the game the right way was more important to us uh, ultimately. So we always eventually got along. I mean, it was one of those uh, like a brother, you, 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 you know, you, the love hate relationship that you have, uh, but ultimate you're you're always going to love them. And uh, so, you know, without Jojo, again, like Sean, I wouldn't be here right now. Okay. Well, so take that, Jojo. Wait. Charlie's lagged. All right. Yeah. Let him okay. go. Uh, Charlie's frozen. No, I have nothing further. I just want to say thank you, Coach Tim. It's always hey. a, a pleasure talking to you. And we learn so much every time. Even if we've known each other for decades, it's always great to hear new stories from you. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's, it's 30 years and counting in the league right now. So, right. you know, got a lot hey, to we've, talk about. We've been about. following you from the start. So, yeah, a lot of stories. So, it's fun to get them out there. It really is. I enjoy your, you guys calling me and asking me. It's fun to talk. Thanks a lot, yeah. Coach. We appreciate Thank you. it as well. Thank, Thank you, Coach. You We're going to have okay. you again soon. I'll get sure. in touch with you once again. Okay. Thanks to everyone who's uh, watching on FB Live for joining us. And uh, that's Coach Tim Cohn. Thank 22 you. championships, guys. All right. All right. Good. Yeah, thank right, you, coach. everybody, for listening. Okay, so all the best, I'll, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll right. be ending the uh, meeting right now. Okay. Okay. Everyone stay safe. All right. Stay bye safe. Bye-bye.